Hello lovely people, welcome to part two of my June reading wrap up. Part one was all of the books I read as part of my Pride Month celebration. I will link to that down below if you've not seen it already, do check it out. Um, this part two is literally just like everything else that I read in the month. <laughs> there is no rhyme, there is no reason. Um, the first book that I finished in June was uh, The Girl Who Fell Beneath the Sea by Axie O. This is a um, YA fantasy. I saw it comped a lot to Spirited Away. That was why I was kind of interested in it. Um, our main character, essentially we're setting this world where um, there is the sea god and um, where our main character is from, they believe that the sea god is wrathful and angry and has abandoned them and so they um, make these like sacrifices of these uh, girls to be the sea god's bride um, and they ship them out to the sea and then they're like taken down to sort of the spirit world um, and our main character, uh, the person who is supposed to be the sea god's bride is actually someone who our main character's brother is in love with and so our main character sort of like takes her place in the sacrifice and then finds herself in the spirit realm um and then while there it becomes apparent that like things are a little bit different than they thought and maybe there are some things that need solving fixing etc to help save her people this is one of those books where i had a genuinely fun time reading it at this point towards the end of July when I'm actually filming this I am slightly fuzzy on the actual details um I think partly that's because I really really enjoyed lots of the world and um the plot as it was happening like the spirit world was really interesting to be part of um there was a fun cast of characters there was some nice like little like visual imagery bits but also there was quite a lot happening and sometimes I wasn't super like I was rooted in like certain elements of the world but then occasionally while there were like lots and lots of plot happening I was also a bit like unclear so I, I think maybe I just have sort of forgotten a lot of detail so I had a fun time I think if you like enjoy um like YA fantasy it's like a perfectly fun YA fantasy read the spirited away like links like I definitely see the similarities there but very much it's not a rehash it is very much its own thing telling its own story and I really appreciated that had a fun time I just currently can't remember that much about it <laughs> um I also read Lord Edward Dies by Agatha Christie which is part of my grand plan to read all of Agatha Christie's works um Lord Edward Dies I think my Goodreads review of this is just oh I try so hard to be Poirot and yet I am always the Hastings <laughs> because this is a Poirot that is narrated from the point of view of Hastings who is someone who narrates quite a lot of the Poirot books and Hastings is very much like the foil to Poirot whereby Hastings like always like misunderstands always takes people at their word and believes them or suspects the wrong people and then Poirot gets to be like wow you're such a good sounding board because you tell me what the obvious answer is and then Poirot uses all of his reasoning to be like that's obviously not the case um so this one is about Lord Edgware who dies Lord Edgware's wife is wants a divorce and she approaches Poirot to ask him for his help in getting a divorce um and quite soon after that Lord Edgware dies and his wife is the main suspect and so Poirot is looking into it to ascertain like what the truth of the matter is um and the reason I say I am the Hastings is because there were like things which I was like this is very obviously not the case but there were details which I at the end when the reveal was taken I was like oh boy I took that thing for granted as being true I also took this thing for granted as being how it was presented um so I, I do like when Agatha Christie does that to me when I spend the whole book being like oh my god it's so obvious that this person is like this or like whatever and then at the end she's like I know that you've been thinking that and I'm gonna switch it up so yeah, I always have a fun time. That was definitely um, an enjoyable reading one for me, for sure. 
Um, the only non-fiction that I'm going to talk about in this wrap-up, I did read more non-fiction in the first part if you want to go check that out. This is Border, A Journey to the Edge of Europe by Kapka Kasabova. Um, Kapka Kasabova is a Bulgarian writer. My Bulgarian friend recommended this to me because I'm going to Bulgaria for her wedding and I like to read around places that I'm going to be visiting and so she said that this is a great way of getting a bit of Bulgarian history. It's exploring the border between Bulgaria, Greece and Turkey. So you're dabbling on history of all these three places and particularly the way that they overlap and interweave and that kind of a thing. Um, Kapka Kasabova is like journeying along the border so the the narrative structure is sort of that you start in one place and she travels to different places as she's going along and she's interacting with people who live there now, she's giving you their stories, she's giving you part of her own story, she's very much just like taking you through history but not in like a linear way, she's doing it like in response to the landscape and the places that she's at and tapping into local um, traditions and that kind of thing. Um, I found this really readable, I really enjoyed the reading experience of it, I definitely did learn a lot of history of pieces that I didn't know about and I have a sense of this border, like borders are like liminal spaces, the, the borders that we strictly impose are never as cut and dry in reality. So one thing I liked was this like overlapping of culture and of history and define how do you define yourself and how sometimes definitions are so similar even if you're technically in different countries. Um, she looks a lot about like migration particularly with uh, migrant crises and stuff like this. One thing I will say is that she's definitely an author who she likes to lean into like slightly more spiritual aspects as well and stuff like this. Like sometimes she presents things as fact that I found myself questioning only because I think she did a comparative point at one point when she was talking about like a set of ruins that are like supposed to be haunted and then she compared it to um, the curse from opening Tutankhamun's tomb and I was like bit of a bad curse if it waited many many years to kill some of the people. You know, like Tutankhamun's tomb curse is like a narrative that we like to project, but when you look at the timeline of when people actually died, you're like, it's not a very good curse if it waits like 10 years, is it? Like a bit bad. <laughs> That's just life, really. Um, so there were just like a few moments like that where um because I think it's I think it works for the text because the text is doing liminal space and it's doing um Borders, like when you're talking about borders and the, the the sort of porous nature of them, I think it makes sense narratively to also look at like borders between like worlds, both like real and spiritual and that kind of thing. So I think it worked very well for the text. It's just there's some of the stuff that she's like giving to you as fact. I was like, I might need to look into this later. Um, but I really enjoyed it and I'd really recommend it. It was like a very engaging like travel log sort of history kind of thing. I also listened to an audiobook uh, in June and that was Scarlet by Genevieve Cogman. I have talked a lot about Genevieve Cogman on this channel because I really enjoy her Invisible Library series and Scarlet is her first book since she sort of closed that series off so I was super duper interested to see where she would be going next and this was a really enjoyable listening experience because it's definitely moving away from the type of narrative that the Invisible Library was in that. There is obviously like an overlap because the Invisible Library is like, t uh, it's like multi-dimensional travel. There's a library that steals rare books to help maintain like the structure of space-time and that kind of thing. Whereas Scala is rooted in the French Revolution. It is sort of a retelling or a response of to the Scarlet Pimpernel story, except for in this world, the nobility are vampires. Um, so there is that element that is like, in this case, fantasy. Um, and vampires work so well <laughs> as an analogy for the ruling classes, particularly in the French Revolution, where, you know, the whole reason that the peasants rose up against them is because the nobility were, like, bleeding the land dry. So it works very well as, like, a little comparative thing. Um, the reason I say it's quite different is that the Invisible Library series is very much like a lot of the time you're just like hurtling through, events are happening and that kind of stuff, whereas Scarlet was a lot slower. Um, I really enjoyed the historical detail, I felt very very rooted in revolutionary France for quite a few number of reasons and I feel like she really set that scene and painted it well. Um, 
there's a in addition it's weird because you say like french revolution with vampires and actually the vampiric element is in some ways quite background for a lot of it because you're actually following our main character eleanor who is being she is a servant who um is essentially being recruited by the scarlet pimpernel's organization to help them with a mission so a lot of the narrative particularly in the first half is the practicalities of preparing for this mission um traveling across to france traveling through france like the action doesn't really kick in until much nearer the end there is like another supernatural element which develops as it goes on and um, i'm really interested to see how that develops further in the sequel because that's something that's introduced but certainly has not actually blossomed yet as a narrative point. I also really enjoyed that there's a real focus on like Eleanor's class influences so much about her experience and particularly because the group of the Scarlet Pimpernel is um, upper class nobility people and Eleanor quite frequently faces up to the differences in their position and how what they are able to quite happily do is something that is continually barred to her and will never be an option for her and it really does explicitly delve into that and I really enjoyed that and also like the gender aspect of that as well because Eleanor's not just in the servant class but she's also a woman in the servant class and that puts her in different situations um so yeah I genuinely really enjoyed this I do think it is a very slow paced book and definitely like could have been tightened a bit so if you don't like slow paced character led that kind of thing if you're wanting more of a romp I would say that this wouldn't maybe not be the book for you um, I'm certainly interested to see where we will be going moving on, but it, it definitely felt like a setup book in many ways, but I'm interested in the world that it's setting up and I have a real soft spot for stuff that's set in the French Revolution, so it worked well for me. If you want a faster paced book set in the French Revolution that has fantasy elements, you should read Dangerous Remedy by Kat Dunn. Cracking. So that is another fave, <laughs> another fave who I talk about all the time. This is About Time by Jodie Taylor. I would just like to officially go on record and say that I think currently I might be enjoying the Time Police series more than the Chronicles of St Mary's, which is a bold statement to say, but I stand by it. Um, the Time Police is an offshoot of the Chronicles of St Mary's. So the Chronicles of St Mary's is about essentially, to boil it down reductively, time travelling historians. The Time Police were originally sort of um, enemies in that, in that their job is to maintain timeline, like, structure and that kind of stuff so if you're piddling about and potentially causing havoc they're not really about that life um but in this series we're really fleshing them out as an organization that is in a time of change and particularly at this point an organization whose presence is actually very necessary to stop corp not just individuals from messing with the structure of time but actually corporations and governments who might want to exploit it for their own financial gain and don't really care about the resultant fallout because there is a mole in the time police who has been causing issues and that's something that is a big part of this one thing I enjoyed about this actually is again um, Luke and Jane sort of get a lot of fleshing out like Luke is so irritating for part of this but it's all necessary to character development so as it was happening I was like oh because he's made a lot of progress in previous books and it felt like at the start he was regressing um, and I think that that's a testament to how much I was invested in that character progress that when he started to regress to previously bad behaviours I was like for fuck's sake Luke get it together Jane got to really grow in this we got a lot of insight into Jane um family history that was really interesting and we got um i am really enjoying the relationship between luke and his father i'm finding that like an interestingly complex little one i also really enjoyed mikey is much more present in this one as well which was really great so there's characters in this that have sort of been present for a while but are getting to really like grow whether that's in the background or the forefront and i'm really enjoying that i am super enjoying this look at an organization in a time of flux and the, the types of people who would be out to exploit that and then what the future of that looks like. I just think that there's a really interesting rooted discussion happening in this that goes beyond just time travel shenanigans um, but actually is about like structural change and that kind of thing which for me I'm all about that life. I am absolutely ripping through these and I'm thoroughly enjoying them. The final two books I unfortunately did not like as much 
um, and I kind of think I might have screwed myself over somewhat by picking them up immediately after this. <laughs> so these are um, The Quantum Curators and the Fabergé Egg and The Quantum Curators and the Enemy Within by Eva St. John. Um, again, these are lent to me by my mum because uh, she has been looking for series that are comparative to Jodie Taylor's series and this is one that is often recommended. Um, I did not think this was very good and I think I might have been harsher on it because I'm so into this series right now that going straight from this to this made me have lots of niggles with this world. So if you really like this series, I apologise. I did not have that same reading experience. I didn't hate it. They are so quick and easy to read. It's essentially, instead of time travel, we have like quantum travel. So there is like Earth A and Earth B. And one of them, I'm going to get it the wrong way around. I think it's Earth A. Alpha Earth is like the Library of Alexandria didn't burn down. It made all of the world realise how important it is for them to come together in solidarity. And so they have this like seemingly perfect society and they've developed quantum travel. Um, however, the downside of their perfect society is no one makes good art. So they travel across to Beta Earth, which is our world, which has much more conflict and terrible human beings and all of that. But the plus side is that we make really great things and when things are about to be destroyed utterly they take them from our world and they bring them to theirs and they preserve them um one thing that i already didn't like about this is that i think that that fundamental setup is a bit dodge in that like um it implies that like good art only comes out of a world where there is suffering and I think that we've debunked that enough and in its credit I will say that was how I felt after the first book the second book has a character in it who is explicit who does explicitly at one point say that and that how messed up that is so I'm willing to grant you that some of my niggles from this first book we're starting to be addressed in this book and potentially are further addressed going forward. So, like, caveat wise, again, if you're watching this and you love this series, like, I would just like to say, like, I acknowledge that she is potentially setting up a lot of these things to then be unpacked. Um, they're super duper readable, for sure. Our main, we have sort of two characters. Neith is our main character from Alpha Earth, who is a quantum curator. Um, and then we have Julian who, Julian? No, Julius. And then we have Julius from Beta Earth, who is like a researcher kind of thing. And so we get alternating chapters from their perspectives. And um, Neith is the person going on these missions. And Julius is sort of like, in this first one, they're trying to find this Fabergé egg. And Neith is trying to recover it. Julius knows the person who is discovering it. And it's sort of these like two timelines. I just will say that one thing I struggled with is that I do find this very readable. I think that the writing is like super accessible, very, very easy to read, sped through both of these books, but it's not a fast paced series like it is being branded as. So it's it's on all of the um, like reviews and stuff that I see of it. It's like fast paced. I found it so slow. These two characters don't meet until about halfway through this book. Half of this book is just set up. Um, and I found that like challenging because I was like, fast paced, travel, travel. And then it just wasn't fast paced. And I was like, oh, wow, quite slow, very readable, quite slow. So I was like unsatisfied after this first book, but I thought to myself, I will give it a second book a go. Um, and I, I think maybe I found some of the characterization like a bit looser. I don't know. Neith? I felt like in the second book lost a lot of what made her really cool in the first book because I did think she was a cool person and in the second book I just she Julius becomes much more competent I think and so then takes away some of like what Neith is bringing to the table I don't know um I also just felt like a lot of the plot points are so transparent like the enemy within I know who that is <laughs> Like really early on. Um, so there's so much plot points that are really transparent that when you're then taking like half a book for your people to meet before the crescendo starts to happen, like I get frustrated with that because I'm like, oh boy, howdy. Like I was spending a lot of time reading a lot of words just to get to a point that I already know. Um, and I just felt like, I think again, because I read it after reading this and this is doing so, this is really working for me. It highlighted to me the areas in which this is lacking for me 
because I think it's perfectly fine and I don't think it's like awful but it's really lacking that magic for me and it's lacking those details that make me want to read on like I I kind of get like the how everything functions in this but I don't really find their missions very interesting there's not a lot of history in it actually because one thing that I really like about the Chronicles of St Mary's is historical detail like Jodie Taylor like takes you to a place and she gives you a lot of historic detail and you feel really rooted in that place whereas this first book is like set in our contemporary time and they do like a tiny little bit of history in this one but it's not very present and it's quite modern history so I think maybe I'd, I'd wanted more of a historical element to this quantum traveling for sure and I find this like society structure like inherently a bit weird how it's just like oh everyone in this perfect world is like completely compliant and no one apparently thinks for themselves and everyone in our world is like you know just normal people as I know them I don't know just something something about it's just not working for me so I had I did I did have a perfectly fine time reading them I'm not going to read the rest of the series because if I'm if I'm complaining about it now I feel like I'll just keep complaining in videos and that's not what I want to do I want to read books that I love and I want to tell you how much I love things so definitely if you're a person who likes the Chronicles of St Mary's there is a chance that you will love this. People do love this. So if the type of like quantum curation, parallel worlds, traveling to rescue artifacts, if that's something that interests you, like do give it a go. Absolutely. Um, it's for me lacking a lot of that like historical detail that is something that I really like about Jodie Taylor. And that little cast of characters is not one that I'm like super emotionally attached to like I am with Time Police. St Mary's that kind of thing um but there's some cool stuff that is everything that I read for the rest of June I would really really love to hear if you've read any of these your thoughts your feelings all of that jazz um yeah just leave me a comment down below it's always nice to have a chat and I in the meantime hope that you're having a really nice day I will see you next time where I'll talk about something else bookish I am sure um but yeah see you next time